Right, thank you for that, Fotis. Lovely to see everyone today. So we call this uh, presentation, What's the Use? Exploring non-academic applications of computational literary studies. And it is in the context of the CLS Infra project, which many of you will know and which I'll say a little bit more about in one second. So we started from a question of what is applied humanities? Does it exist? Should it exist? Should it not exist? Um, and in particular, applied literary studies, because there is a long tradition of arguments for the use of the humanities, some of which are better and some of which are worse. And you probably know many of these. Um, I can give you lots and lots of examples. Going back, I think, to at least the 1990s with Martha Nussbaum talking about the capacity of literature and narrative to contribute to the formation of citizens through to more modern approaches, which are really actually quite focused on um, the contribution that narratives can make to technology development. And what we found looking into this is that the idea of an applied humanities exists, but it isn't as stable as it is, for instance, in many other disciplines where you would have very much a basic and an applied arm to any field. In spite of this, however, um, there are a lot of humanities relevant pieces of work that are based upon the power of narrative and storytelling, whether that's new journalism, brand narratives, narrative medicine, bibliotherapy, narrative economics. So we felt seeing all these trends, we were wondering what the, what the, how big the gap was between these sort of non-scholarly uses of essentially a literary studies paradigm and the scholarly ones. So within the CLS Infra project, which is standing for the Computational Literary Studies Infrastructure, uh, there's the URL there if you're interested, this is a four-year project bringing together 14 partner institutions from across Europe, including some in this room, uh, to build a sustainable infrastructure for research, essentially in the first instance, with a shared resource of high quality data tools, knowledge to aid new approaches to studying literature in the digital age. Now our specific task in this project is to look at the potential for use of such an infrastructure from beyond the academic sphere, maximizing use and impact, being a key driver for sustainability. We're working with a, within a European funding context, therefore, the idea of the size of the user base is important to making the case for the sustainability of the infrastructure. So we did this in a number of different ways. We started with a literature review, and from that we extracted a sort of taxonomy of the kinds of approaches we were finding. And then we committed to doing about 15 interviews to look at the role that fiction and data analytics do or might play in a participant's work. And this is where it became difficult, I think Vera will say something about this, about our, our problem of the double hypothetical, where we're saying to people, if this were to exist, would you use it? And the people that we spoke to were coming from the sectors of policy, consultancy, management consultancy generally, journalism, publishing, medicine or psychology, in particular bibliotherapy, and also um, art practitioners. So starting with just a little bit of a look into the literature review and the taxonomy we developed. So we looked across a very wide body of research um, for uses of literature, fiction, narrative, or storytelling in fields beyond literary studies. Now I know, you don't hit me in the questions, these are different things. However, they are used, the terms are actually used interchangeably, both inside some of these applied, what look, talk, and quack like applied literary studies, and also outside of literary studies. So we found that actually to narrow the terminology was to actually miss the object of study. And based on these findings, we came up with four models that summarize these uses, which I'll come to in a minute. In the whole, we consulted about 60 works on the topic um, using keywords like applied literature, applied humanities, applied digital humanities, uh, applied narrative, storytelling, etc. And what's interesting is the fields that we ended up finding work in were very broad. Machine learning, AI, design thinking, psychology, medicine, policy, culture, generally not in literary studies, interestingly enough, but that's a, a, another story um, that we can go into. From all of these examples, we found that there was really four models that we were seeing again and again. Some of them were closer to each other, but we felt the four models captured what was going on. First of all, using fictional narratives as evidence for making claims about the past and present cultural and historical identities. Um, so history, research, geocriticism, a lot of this in, um, in geography. Second, using fictional narratives as a mean to prototype future scenarios, cultures, identities, and technologies. So futures institutes, design futures, imagined futures, et cetera. Third, 
using fictional narratives to build or access predictive models. Uh, and if any of you know the German Cassandra project, this was a very good example of oh, what we were looking at. And finally, um, using fictional narratives as a mechanism for specific capacity building. So for example, developing empathy or developing leadership qualities. Um, and there's a couple of quotes there. Again, um, Vera will go into the interviews next, but you'll see that there was a way in which these different models were able to, to resonate. So for example, a policymaker uh, coming from an Irish perspective was looking at the way Northern Ireland was particularly strong in the way narratives would uh, express experiences, Seamus Heaney being the example, and empathy being the one that came out a lot in publishing. So that gets to the interviews. So with the models in place, we could finally address the people who we wanted to ask. So from the fields of policy consultancy, journalism, publishing, medicine, and art. And we asked them basically questions about what role does narrative fiction or storytelling play then present the models to them and just see their reactions to it, also whether they could see any dangers or health warnings around these models. And then also we said, if this toolbox existed, CLS toolbox, could you see yourself using it in your work? And that basically comes or brings us to the main challenges, which is that we started the entire conversation from two hypotheticals, as Jennifer said, if such an infrastructure existed, would you use it or such a toolbox? And then in addition to that, we needed to contextualize it for the participants within their sectorial specific requirements. And that is often especially challenging with highly pressured work environments um, so that a lot of people cannot, don't even have the time to lift their heads to think about these things. And then of course, of the, the issue with use of literature and narrative is overall not the same. Um, and a lot of participants were using them almost interchangeably. Nevertheless, the reactions to the models were overall really positive, especially to literature's evidence of the past and present and literature's prototyping the future. Every, every participant said that they could see themselves, um, that th this could s have a useful application or lead to better outcomes, whereas there was a lot more hesitation around using literature as a predictive model, especially in the military context, such as in the Cassandra project. Um, with literature as capacity building, there was a bit of hesitation around the management speak or almost literature becoming business-like in this sense. Nevertheless, uh, especially publishers um, said that this is a very good way or that literature makes us better human beings or can develop capacities. And lastly, more than half of the participants could see themselves using, definitely using such a CLS toolbox. But then there were also challenges raised by the interviewees. And first of all is that if you recognize these applications of literature, aren't you just encouraging literary production for, this specific, for these specific applications? And an example was brought in by a publisher saying that, um, yeah, this is a problem like with the Moroccan rocks that initially they were produced for the local market or with the specific cultural connection, but then as they started to produce it for the tourism market or for people from abroad, it lost touch with its original purpose of production. And then also that knowing these applications, they could also lead to the abuse of power and that is especially a concern from the policy side because they acknowledged that most of, like almost all pol policymakers we talked to how powerful stories can be to sway emotions and public opinion. But of course that could go either way and there is a challenge in there. And then also, that was more from the consultancy side, a concern that one would force literature into sectors what isn't useful. And I think that's especially, we need to be aware of that as well, that we will not try to impose these models or these applications into sectors where it just doesn't lead to any um, good outcomes or um, defeats the purpose. But this brought us to a few conclusions. I mean, first of all, that all participants saw value in at least one of the models of applied literature, and that 66.6% .6 said that they could see definitely uh, use, see themselves using a CLS toolbox to facilitate or enrich their work. And then, of course, the main challenge of the two hypotheticals that we weren't as conscious about when we started the interviews. And then um, we managed to learn more about the specific requirements of the professions. And then just the conclusion is that um, to bridge the gap between our research um, and the fields beyond academia is about building relationships and 
So even the participants who saw value in that said, you need to start building those relationships now, such as from policy. There is a growing infrastructure and a significant interest in data and evidence-based policy. And I think in terms of this project, if you're seriously interested in getting a connect into policy, now's the time to start building those relationships and then you build them for the long term. And then one person who tried to work between um, metaphors and uh, storytelling and healthcare said that um, when you collaborate, uh, the, cru the crucial thing is to collaborate with people who work in the field where ideally you would, we would like to make a difference. And it's not easy to get started. It took me a long time to get started with that because it takes time to build trust with the people in healthcare. They're very busy and it takes a while to build your networks. So thank you for your attention.